And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Kelly Sammy, who during her near-death experience encountered angels, which we're going to learn about today and more. Kelly, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thanks, Jeff. I'm really, really blessed to be here and I appreciate you and your followers equally. So thank you. Well, thank you. And we are excited to have you. So let's start on the day that you died and go from there. Sounds good. So my near-death experience was in 2008 and it was a lead up really. Um, I was what I refer to as actively living in depression and anxiety for 38 years of my life. Um, I grew up in somewhat of a fight or flight mode, as many of us do. Um, My story isn't really unique as far as the traumas and the dramas in my life leading up to this. You know, I think we all grow up with some familial breakdowns and um, toxics, toxicities in our lives. Um, And that was definitely the way I was born and raised. And I just kind of lived life with a mentality of victimhood is what I define it as now. I certainly wouldn't have when I was living it. I thought everything was happening to me. And I took everything that came into my life as a personal attack or a vendetta. Um, Starting at the age of three, I was... um, I was tested by my paternal grandfather. I'm sorry, my maternal grandfather. And that was a hush hush secret in our family, even though everyone kind of knew that something had happened. And so I think at a very young age, I stepped into life differently and I started to portray it as a victim of every circumstance. And I only share that because it literally leads up to what ends up happening in my life, which is, um, I call it projecting my own fears about every other person that came into my experience. Again, I didn't know this then, hindsight's twenty twenty, um, But I just knew that I needed to protect myself from a young age from the world. And yet I had a tender heart and I was always very intuitive. Um, I I understood people and I understood connections, but as I moved through life, it just seemed daunting. It felt hard. And I always had what I call a plan D, which is not normal. And I now know that, but I was living with a diseased mind and I was never diagnosed. But again, hindsight being 2020, as a young child, anxiety and depression were just part of my story. And I always had this thought in my head that played out. If this doesn't go well, I can always take myself out. I can always end this. And I now realize how irrational that is, but it was my plan D. There was, you know, the normal people's lives of plan A and plan B and plan C. I had the abnormal one tacked on the end, which was a plan D. So that went through me through my entire life. Fast forward to being around the age of 38. And I was now living abroad on a tiny island in New Zealand. And I had moved there after a horrific divorce. I had a young child and it seemed a really good place to raise my child as a single mom because my ex-husband was from there. And we agreed that would be a good place and a safe place for you to be a single mom. So off I went. Still recovering from the divorce, many other things that had piled on top of that health-wise. And I just really was not in a good headspace. I'd had a full-blown hysterectomy, so I was going through all kinds of hormonal stuff and had a good few years there. But again, that plan D starts to creep in. And the excitement of the newness wore off of a new place to live. And I started to think, I'm no good for my son. I'm no good for the people who love me. They'll be better off without me. And life just kept bringing me that reflection because it was where I was dwelling the most. And so, of course, more and more victimhood stories just kept piling in. And 
at one stage, it wasn't any one particular thing. I remember hearing my head say, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Now plan D takes effect. I had finally come forward with my then partner um, and expressed to him that I was having severe anxiety and depression. No one knew this about me, by the way. I was that person who moved through life very happy, did all the things, got up every day, got dressed, put my makeup on, put my smile on and moved through the day. So it was very hidden. But after everyone would go to bed and they would be tucked in and sleeping, I would climb into the shower and I would turn the hot water on and I would sit on the floor and I would cry. No one knew this and I kept it hidden. But I finally did tell my partner, we agreed it was time for me to go and talk to someone. So I did. And unfortunately, not knowing, because I was never one to take alcohol or medication, that antidepressants would actually make me worse. That's what started to happen. So I started to take the medications and I became really aware that I was having what we refer to as ideation or suicidal ideation or wanting to leave the planet ideation, whatever you want to refer to it as. That was going on and I was very honest about it with the doctor. When I would see him, I would say, I don't think this is helping. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to actually visually you know, plan and see things. And they just kept playing with the doses. So at some stage, I said, enough is enough. And I stopped taking the medications, but I started saving them. So they were giving me anti-anxiety, anti-depression, sleeping aids, and um, all kinds of other medications. So I literally would just put them in one bottle. And I had a huge bottle saved. And the day when the, that was the straw that broke the camel's back came, my bottle was full. It was all mixed with medications. I had no idea what was in there. and. I started to plan. And I, again, very diseased mind, wanted to have photos with my family at the time. And I thought that would one day be something they would look back on as a happy memory. Obviously, very diseased mind. Why would they look back on that day? But again, you don't know what you don't know until you know, right? So I did all the photos got my favorite pillow and my blanket, told my partner that I had an appointment, that I would be gone overnight. And he had the children, including my son, did my goodbyes, got into my SUV, and I took off. And I drove around for a while until I found a location that was very um, private. We lived on a tiny, tiny island off of the uh, island of Auckland, New Zealand, an even smaller one that you had to ferry to. So I drove around that island until I found a spot that had been basically cleared for construction that overlooked the bluff of the ocean. It was beautiful. And I drove my SUV in there and I found a spot. On the way in, I picked up some pre-mixed gin and tonics, which I wasn't a drinker, but in my mind, I thought that would be the drink to mix with the alcohol. And I had a pad of paper and a pen to finish off suicide notes. I had written most of them already, the lengthier ones, but I had a few that I wanted to finalize. Again, very irrational thinking and parked, put some music on and I started to finish those notes. Throughout that process, I was very much shaking and yet I was saying over and over in my head, I know that there's a merciful God. I know that whatever happens here today, I'm going to be loved through this. And I was raised Catholic. I was raised that this was a sin, but something in me truly felt that I would be doing the others that I loved so much better by not being here and bringing this part of myself into their experience, including my son. So, as I continued to drink and slowly take the medication and finish the notes, um, I started to feel the medication take effect. So I thought maybe I could have a really quick bio break and then get into the back of the SUV. So I opened the door and I went to step out and I realized, oh, we're way beyond that. My legs felt like noodles and I just literally was not feeling myself at all. And again, never being one to take drugs 
or drink alcohol. At this stage, I'd had about three gin and tonic pre-mixes and I was very slowly taking the pills and making sure that they were going to stay down while I was writing these notes. So the last note that I knew I needed to leave was to the person whoever was going to find my body. And I felt really strongly about this. I just, uh, just inside my heart felt for whoever that was going to be, that that was their responsibility and why I didn't want to do this at home. So that was the last note. And I put it on the top of the stack and I put them all on the dashboard. I pushed my pillow and my blanket to the back and I climbed into the back seat and I laid flat. And I was looking up at my SUV, which did not have a sunroof. And I just started to wonder, how do you know when you're dead? Because you never asked that question, right? And so I was like, well, how will I know? Like I felt so different in my body already. I felt things were happening, but how do I know when I'm actually dead? Which tells me even now, something in me and within me always knew there was something that kept going, right? Because why would I be asking that question? But I didn't have that insight then. And I just kept saying over and over, if there's a loving and merciful God, which is what I believe in, I know there's something after this. And that would calm me down. And then I would just say, follow the breath. Is it still happening? I guess when that goes, that's when you go. Now, I now realize that's a form of meditation, but at the time I had absolutely no clue. So I was following the breath and I kept listening for it. And then I was hearing this internal dialogue you're still breathing, you're still breathing, you're still breathing. And as I paid more attention to that, I started to hear these crackling, popping sounds. Um, you'll hear every NDE ear say this, so I am not surprised you're going to hear me say it. It's very hard to put into words the experientiality of this, but I do my best. These sounds were not external, like fireworks. They were not even in my head. I was them. So as the popping and the crackling was happening, I was feeling that. I was becoming that. And I didn't know it. I just thought the medication was making me a little off. But I wasn't scared and I was leaning into it. And the breath was, again, just moving in a really nice pace. And I wasn't terrified and I felt that I was blessed and I felt the people I was leaving were blessed and the next thing I knew I felt the sensation of pulling and it was very intense and it felt like the whole car was rocking my body was rocking and this popping and crackling and again it wasn't me I was all of this I was the expression of the popping and the crackling and the movement. It's so surreal because I can feel it as I'm talking about it, but as I'm in this physical vessel right now, it feels very clunky. It didn't feel like that. It was just, I guess, how you would imagine atoms and molecules feel bobbing around into each other. That's how I felt. And as this pulling sensation took on, the next thing I knew was this just like powerful whoosh feeling and I was no longer a body and I wasn't scared. I had, there was no thoughts going on at all, but I noticed that it felt as though I was above the SUV looking down into it. Again, I did not have a sunroof or anything, but it was like there was no top on it and I saw this body laying there. And it was wiggling and it was moving around and it was obviously distressed, but I wasn't feeling any of that. I wasn't fearful. I wasn't in pain. I wasn't in agony. But that thing down there sure looked like it was going through it. I didn't feel remorse, regret. I didn't even feel sadness for it. I wasn't excited. There was just this calm nature about it, is the only way I can describe it and there was nobody there it was just this energy of looking and noticing and just wow no do I go somewhere none of that was happening so I don't know how long things go on in this event 
Um, what I later learned, of course, is there's no time or space. That's all part of the linear that we need. So I don't know how long this actually took effect. Um, but as there was no interest in the physical body and what it was going through, I'm assuming that that was when the next wave of kind of a pulling louder, even popping and cracking, and the sensation of upwards um, seemed to have carried this energy that I had become because I wasn't a body anymore. And the next thing I knew, I burst into what I call the abyss. It was all darkness. I was all of it. I was not scared. It was not frightening. I just felt the most intense amount of love I've ever felt. Literally pitch black, nothing there. And I would have been content there. I would have been absolutely content. I call it sitting in the hand of God is what it felt like. There were no questions still. There was no, is this all there is? There was no regret. Again, I just want to make it very clear. Thoughts were completely gone. There was just nothing but bliss and an honoring that I had returned to whatever I really was. I call it home. So again, I don't know how long I stayed there or what else might have been going on in that space. But it seems as though as that resting in that space took effect, I felt the sensation of pulling again. And now I was getting smells, the most intense, beautiful floral-like smells and angelic sounding choirs. And I felt, again, this pulling sensation and heard this loud pop. And now I am in the most blissful pink color I can ever, 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 ever imagine. And I've tried to recreate it with watercolors and everything else. I can't recreate it here. I wasn't seeing it. Again, I was it. I was the smells. I was the sounds. I was this intense color. And I just felt such a bliss, such a love. And I knew, I knew I was okay, but I wasn't even asking that question. There was no thoughts happening at all. No, where do I go? What do I do? Where have I come to? None of that was going on. I don't know why I knew. I just knew that something was beckoning me, for lack of better words. And energetically, it was the first time that I saw an expression of something that wasn't me and I wasn't it. It felt separate from me. And I didn't know why I knew, but I just knew that it was Archangel Gabriel. Raised Catholic might be why that happened. I don't know. I don't try to understand any of this. It's not for me to know or understand. But I just saw this beautiful angelic presence doing this. And with no instruction, just that emphasis caused the momentum for following. I wasn't a body. I wasn't flying. I wasn't even floating. I just was all of it. So the next thing I was aware of was being in this space that I call almost like a tomb. And this tomb was so magnificent. It was the first time in all of this that I noticed a thought arise that almost felt like I wasn't worthy to be there. But as soon as that tried to enter the space, I noticed it was loved and gone. It literally just abolished itself. Like it can't even penetrate this love that we are. And the expression of being there just permeated this love throughout my whole self without being physical. And this is where I say I had what we would refer to, I guess, as a review of life. Um, everything that I had experienced in my 38 years flashed in front of me. All of it, the good, the bad, the indifferent, just flashed from birth all the way to the moment of my last breath. 
in seconds, it felt. And what I noticed, and again, I wasn't thinking it, was just all of it was celebrated. I felt like all of it was a win. All of it was a joy. All of it was an expression. And there was no, that was naughty. This was wrong. This was bad. You hurt that soul. They hurt you. None of that was going on. It was just a celebration of all of it energetically. When that reel of visuals, um, again, it wasn't outside of me. I was it expressing it and viewing it um, ended. I just had this inner knowing that there were others there that wanted to communicate with me, similar to how Archangel Gabriel had. I just had this sense of knowing. And again, their expressions were physical to me, even though I wasn't a body, they appeared to me as a physical presence. Some of them, not the age that they would have been. And some of them clearly not in the stage that they would have been if they had still been in the body. Some of them were still in the body. And each of these had messages for me. It would be way too long to go through all of them. But the two most profound I will share, and one of them is a really hard one for many of my uh, followers and people who watch this to understand, but it was the grandfather who had blessed me. And what I realized and recognized was I had never been that physical vessel, nor had he. I had been an expression of that. Therefore, Nothing physical was harmed in that experience. It was similar to watching a movie. Although when I was going through it at the age of three, it did not feel that way. Nor am I saying that I condone any of this. I'm just sharing what happened in my own unique story as my truth. It upsets many, but for me, it gave me freedom because for so many years, I carried that burden. And it created such disharmony in my own relationships, especially with men. So that was healed instantly. And then the next most profound one was my son. Now, at the time that I did this, he would have been approximately six-ish because I'm really bad with dates and times. But he came to me as his 21 year old self. I just knew that. When he appeared, there was this recognition of the voice, but not the physicality yet because I hadn't met him at this age. And there were conversations that happened, none of which I remembered when I re immediately returned to my body. Over the last 15 years, I've gotten a lot of this in downloads. But what I did remember when I returned to my physical body was, mom, I need you. We have things yet to do. I need you to come back. And instantly, I just knew. I knew that I needed to go back. Now, now, again, I didn't have any awareness that I fought with this until later when I returned to my body. I found out that I did want to stay and I did have some objections to this. Um, and tried to negotiate how I could still be with my son without returning to the body. But as I heard that message from him, again, it was like this expression of molecules vibrating and this pulling sensation, which made me recognize something is getting ready to happen without having to program it or tell it anything. The movement began and the smells intensified. The colors again started to become very billowy pink and beautiful and now I saw the legion of angels in Archangel Gabriel it wasn't just the one now it was just this legion I thought they were clouds but then it started to pull away where I could see the unique differences in them and when I knew I was going back into the physical body it was like they sent me away with this message. I didn't understand. It's taken me 15 years to still comprehend this. But when you return to your body, your only role 
is to breathe and not resist. The rest is taken care of. And boom, I was back in that physical body. By now, I had been found because the area that I had parked my SUV was an uh, area they were doing construction on on the Monday. No coincidence. The construction worker had gone out to make sure that all of the landmarks had been marked for the Monday work so that he could call the workers in and say, we're ready to go. And he saw the SUV. He even said that he almost didn't stop because he thought that it was just a bunch of kids had been up there partying because he didn't see a person. He was just going to call it in. But he decided to go up beside the car and saw me in there. Called for support. Next thing you know, I'm being airlifted um, because we were on this tiny island to a hospital in Auckland. The story continues there. I could go on forever with some of the things that happened and I will only share one because literally this just proceeded into being back in the body and that was being in the ER and them working on me and getting me stable and wondering why my liver wasn't damaged, wondering why um, I had gotten sick but all the pill casings were empty. So they knew that it was too late for them to pump my stomach. Um, they were doing blood tests and checking everything and everything was coming back fine. The doctors were doing their rounds. They were asking me questions like, do you see or hear other things people don't, which I think is hysterical because that was the first time I had to trust that I hadn't damaged my brain. When I was asked that question, I immediately saw someone as physically present as Jeff is to me on this screen right now. And that I now know to be my birth guide, Bernadette, who I'd never encountered before. And she said to me, say no, if you tell them you see me, they will lock you up. So I had two choices in that moment, which was to trust her or to say to the doctor, I think I've damaged my brain. And obviously I chose to trust her. I just felt this innate love from her and I didn't feel any fear. So I said, no, I'm good. I'm just so euphoric. Like, I just want everyone to know how beautiful life is. That's all I wanted to do was tell everyone how beautiful life was. I even fought with all the folks in the helicopter trying to get the, the air off of me to tell them, go live life. It's so amazing, you know, and they're thinking this woman, you know, she's off a rocker. She just took all these drugs, she took all this alcohol but I had had the most euphoric, beautiful experience. And all I wanted to do was tell everyone to live and love life. That carried on for months. I was a vibrating being. And if I even looked at a wall, I became it. So, you know, like I said, I could go on for months about all the experiences. Like I say, I still get downloads to this day. But I'll pause there and I'll let Jeff join me and ask questions because I think he might do better at analyzing some of the areas than I will of repeating them. Kelly, thank you for sharing your experience with us. What did those legions of angels look like? The magnificent is the only thing I can say. Nothing like what I had envisioned in my childhood as Catholicism because we put everything into a 3D structure. They were, I think AI is probably getting the closest to what we can imagine is non-dimensional. And they were completely translucent. And everything was telepathic. So if I even tried to take in a face or, you know, their body or their wings or any of that, it was just moving constantly nothing was static like we are in our physical vessels where we're so firm in 3d almost like posters it was just constantly moving and the most beautiful expression of anything i've ever felt you said that you had a diseased mind and you had irrational thinking so when you were on the other side you were separated from that right Absolutely. No thoughts at all. It's kind of hard to me in a way to imagine being separated from the mind because I feel like we classify ourselves as the mind. Do you think you can explain that to us? Yeah. 
I, I liken it to, we've all had that experience where you're in a blissful situation. Maybe it was the first time you held your child and looked into their eyes and all you felt was this immense love. Or you're out in the middle of the ocean or the mountains and you look around and you just feel this like joy and oneness with all of it. And all you feel is bliss. There's nothing talking about it. There's no narrative saying these are mountains. These are clouds. The narrative of it just goes away and there's just the bliss. That's the way I describe it. When you are in the abyss, do you feel that is a starting point for creation? Mm, that's a great question. Yes. However, I don't think it's a starting place. I think it is the place. I think no thingness, no narrative, no physicality, and no need or desires is it. But you're all of it, so there's no contrast there. To experience the contrast or the duality, you have to move into a different vibrational space, which is why I think moving into what we like to call heaven or that pink area isn't it. Because it's by virtue of duality, a distinct separation from it, right? I say to people, how does a mirror know itself? It can't express itself. It needs what? A reflection to know itself. So the abyss to me is it. And I say it because as soon as you name it, it's separate. And I go there when I meditate. And I'm so grateful that I do. I just have an expression of nothingness. And it's the most blissful feeling ever. Could you describe that place as being velvety? Yes. That's a common description that I hear of that. So I was just curious if it was for it's you. A good, it's a good word because it's, it's, gosh, it's so unintangible. It's not, you know, you can't put anything on it that can stick, but that's a, that's, I like that. It's a good one. What do you think causes the popping sound? That vibrational shift, right? If you think of atoms and molecules, which we are, right? This isn't woo-woo. This is scientifically proven. We are atoms and molecules moving at a very high rate. Um, Dr. Hawkins has done a ton of studies on this, if you're not familiar with him. Um, power versus force, and that we're molecular beings, um, and that our vibration Vibration is the attractor to that which is part of the variables that are going on in the matrix. If our vibration shifts very quickly, there is a component of that. Now, many people have written to me and said, you had a DMT experience, which our bodies all have DMT. And when we die, apparently, our bodies release a huge amount of DMT through the brain and the pineal gland and people say that's probably what happened i don't care what happened but i will say that the popping and the crackling to me was a very expedited acceleration of vibration that my body was attempting to keep up with while it was leaving itself if you call it the soul great you got back and it appear that your body was pretty much healed. Do you think that was a divine healing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Even the nurses were making comments. They didn't know I was hearing, not to be a little bit off-putting here, but when they did my um, urinalysis, that my urine smelled like flowers. Just really strange things like that. Um, and. I did still have to go through a detoxing. I was shaking and having the return to my body sensation. So I wasn't walking really well at first. I was still 
very wobbly. Some of that may have been the medications. I don't think it was. I think it was my body trying to readapt to being back in this can, which is what it feels like going back into a sardine can and you have to refold into that can and readapt to that vibration. And I was shaky and a little wound up. Adrenaline was off, all those things. But on the monitors, everything was perfect. You talked about the matrix. So do you believe that we live in some sort of simulated reality? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't think that it's an unkind situation. I think that we are intended to remember our truth. We're intended to unravel the realization that we're all perfect, whole, and complete, and that we're all able to tap into this intuitive psychic piece of ourselves which is just infinite knowledge it's not woo -woo at all it's just that there's an infinite knowledge of consciousness that we're all at liberty to but if we're underneath all of the conditioning and patterns and beliefs constructs that we've developed in our human identity we aren't aware of that anymore um, and as we move into our own inner work and we're able to unravel that more of that goodness just folds in. It's just a natural process. Would you take it as far as this is a dream? And when you wake up on the other side, you're just disoriented and it takes you a while to kind of reorient yourself? Absolutely. And what starts to happen is you start to question, which is the dream? They become so enmeshed when you're back in the body. And I tell people the way that it has felt for me, again, I'm not speaking to anyone else's experience, only mine. We start out here on this linear landscape and everything feels like this is where it is. And you have a big profound experience, whether it's an awakening or near-death experience or out of body, it doesn't matter. We each get this in this lifetime, by the way, even if it's the last seconds of our life things start to invert and it turns and it opens this way and then it widens until there's nothing left. And it's almost like a balloon turning in on itself. You can only see the filters through the consciousness of where you are at that moment vibrationally. We're all in this matrix, but we're all having a different experience in it based on where we are. Why do you think we come here in the first place? Back to the analogy of the mirror, right? If I am all of this, how can I know any of it uniquely? If I'm all of it, and it was a burst of creation and all was created, but I can know none of that, the only way to know the expression of it is by separation. In, in that comes the identity of the incarnation so that I can know what it feels like to have an arm. I can know what it feels like to have all of these expressions of duality, to know love, I must know its opposite, to know darkness, I must know its opposite. Yet, it was never intended for us to forget that we are the expressor and the expression. Are you still in contact with your guide? Oh, even right now, <laughs> yes. It's a part of my expression. It's a normal part of my life. We all have narrative going on. Most of us think it's all ourselves or egos. As we settle that and still that and quiet that through our own inner work of getting those conditioning and beliefs and patterns out of the way, we're more inclined to have that intuitive connection that's always going on with God, with the universe, with love, whatever you call it. I call it God. And my guide, Bernadette, is an active presence in my life. Absolutely. Maybe I should put it this way. Do you still see her like mm. you did that day? If I choose to. Sometimes if I'm having a really thicker day and I just need to feel an energy of love that gets me um, because, you know, I'm not who I was before this. So my whole world is changed. And there are times where I come home after my day of peopling 
And I just want to feel a connection with something that feels a little more human than just the God expression. I know that may sound strange, but it doesn't to me. I will say, Bernadette, will you climb into this bed with me and cuddle with me? She's my best friend. And energetically, yes, I can feel her. I can sense her. She is um, like a sister to me. She's a guide, but she feels what I would refer to as a sisterly energy. Like she will hold me like my own physical sister would and rock me if I have a bad day. Um, and I feel very blessed to have that connection. So yes, if I choose that, yes, but normally no. Would you say that Bernadette is a multidimensional non-human being or was she human in a previous incarnation? So first I'll address the second part of your question because it ties into the first part of your question. All of our expressions are happening simultaneously. So we call it reincarnation or we call it another time, but the various versions of ourselves and aspects are happening now. We just see it all linearly. So we think, you know, there's another expression of me that happened in another life, blah, blah, blah. So she's been in physicality herself and I've acted as a guide for her in another expression that's going on right now somewhere else in the matrix. And we've done that over and over and over and over and over and over and over, which is why she's, we can call it soul family or whatever you want to call it. She's a bigger part of my grand scheme picture outside of the abyss. Do you ever think that you've been in a life together, physically incarnated at the same time? So I just asked her that and she said, yes. So I, cool. no one's ever asked me that. So I literally real time just got that answer. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to be wanting to know more. <laughs> <laughs> After you came back, did you notice that you had any other gifts that you didn't have prior? Yes. So at first, I was aware that I was seeing things other people weren't seeing, obviously with Bernadette, but it went beyond that. Even in the hospital, I started having experience of um, knowing that I was seeing things that other people weren't seeing that were no longer there. We call them dead. Um, and they were coming to me. And as I had returned back to the physical body, I now had physical attributes, which we call fear. And I didn't know any better than to be fearful of them because that was what I had been conditioned. So even though I'd had this profound experience and I had this huge unraveling, those beliefs and constructs were still part of my DNA. So for the first couple of weeks, I had to sleep with the lights on because if I went into sleep and I literally would lay on my back, just like I'm doing right now, and I would look up, they would be hovering over me, all of these dead things. And they looked demonic to me at first. But Bernadette and the guides and the angels, because yes, I had a whole bunch of people working with me, um, would say, just breathe, close your eyes and invite love in and open your eyes again and see it through the correct lens. And that's what I would do. And immediately what once felt like demonic energies over me shifted and I could see beautiful grandmothers and animals and uh, loved ones that were longing to connect with those that were still here, aware that I was seeing them. It took a long time to learn how to drive this new vehicle. And that's what it is. It's, you know, I call it my avatar, you know, my simulator, um, because I didn't come with a guidebook, but I came with a guide. And I've definitely tapped into that. And it's taken 15 years to, to learn how to navigate this. But every time I've heard myself say, I don't know that, I immediately get the download. So, for example, I started working with clients in one-on-one -on -one sessions to help them. And I'd have someone come to me and ask if I was a medical intuitive. And I'd say no. The next day, I'd wake up and I was scanning people's bodies. Like that ability for lack of better terms, was there. And so I've learned not to say no. I just kind of laugh and say, well, now I'm getting that. 
<laughs> that download's coming. Um, and that's what we're all meant to have. We're, we're meant to be able to collectively tap into that consciousness of infinite knowledge. It's there for us on purpose. It's not that I have anything special. A lot of us here are suffering and a lot of us want to not suffer. Yes. So it makes me wonder, are we supposed to be suffering because it's celebrated on the other side or do we need help to stop suffering? Great question. Oh gosh, Jeff. Great question. No one's ever asked me that. The suffering is the mental component. It's not, it's the narrative. So I'll say more about that. Even after this experience, I've lost people I've loved. And even though I know that I can communicate with them, I still go through the human grief, the loss, the physicality, the desire to hold my grandmother or my mother who passed after this or any of my friends. The difference is an awareness, for lack of better terms, that this is the brief encounter. Does that make the suffering go away? No, but it makes it lighter and it allows me to perceive it through a lens that says, let this pass through. It too deserves to be loved. So duality is part of this expression. We don't get to bypass that, but as we continue to do our inner work and our lens gets wider, we do get to a space where the dualistic components come at us and it's almost like you have a deflector that says, I see you suffering. I don't believe you to be true. And it boomerangs away. Now, would I ever say this to someone's three-year-old self going through what I went through? Would I ever say this to someone who is literally at the hands of domestic violence or an abuse situation? No. The expression of this 3D avatar is very real. If you kick my leg right now, I'm going to say, ow. I'm the first one to tell you that. Compassion begins with our own inner work. Finding enough self-love to explore this spiritual part of ourselves, whether it's through religion or spirituality, it doesn't matter, and build and develop that connection with the inner knowingness of who we truly are makes the suffering more palpable, but it never goes away. Do you think due to technology and where we are now at as a civilization, the suffering is greater than it has ever been, and we need help to handle it. This goes back to what I pointed to before, which is we're all in the matrix, but we're having a different expression of it. So mm -hmm. I say the sky is sure blue today, and you look up and you go, God, it's a gorgeous blue. But we don't know if we're seeing the same blue. We just call it blue, right? That question is very unique to the individual in the matrix. Your expression of what you're seeing could be different than mine. And so when we ask a global question like that, it's really hard to answer because I can say to you that as I've continued to do my own inner work, the expression in the outer feels different to me. And I can be sitting in a cafe with people talking about the heaviness of the room, and yet I'm feeling bliss in the room. We're both right, right? You know, I had a college professor who put a coffee mug in front of me, and the handle, you know, was here for me, and the handle was on the other side for her. And she said to me, where is the handle? And I said, on the left. And she said, well, it's on the right for me. We were both right. That's what the matrix is. We're getting our own apparent version of it. We're trying and attempting to express it to the other aspects here. And yet we don't know if what we're lining up on using these words and symbols 
actually match. And that's where most of our uh, um, disconnect comes from because we get so caught up in our beliefs and conditionings. We want to pull people to believe the same beliefs and conditionings, but we don't know what their version of the matrix is. So it's better just to be quiet and do your inner work. Even if your inner work in that moment is debating with the person about what they just said, go inside and work that out in yourself. You don't need to work that out with them. Who created the matrix? It was a spontaneous inquiry from the abyss that said, I am. Notice the long pause there. Yet how can I know that? Bam. And all was created. When you were at the point where you were considering doing plan D, why do people in that situation feel like everyone else would be better off without them? You ask really good questions. You're good at this. I think that we're conditioned from a young age to think that we're always supposed to be the optimal human being, right? I mean, look at the 10 commandments. Look at the ways our parents raise us with morals and constructs. There's not a lot of room in any of that for I'm hurting, I'm suffering, I'm lost. So if you're not living up to this aspiration that the world puts in front of you from the time you take your first breath, you feel like you're failing everyone. If you have a diseased mind, even if you're cooperating with it, like I was, and showing up, you feel like somehow you're going to harm others in that lack of being your best version of yourself and that they'd be better off without you. It's, it's really conditioned in us from a young age. Be your optimal self or pretend you are, basically. Play, till, play it till you make it. Take it till you make it. So basically, maybe what's going on in a person's mind is I'm harming other people. So it's better that I not be here than hurt others. Yeah. And you don't even go to any idea of how much you could be harming them by not being there, right? Your mind, your diseased mind does not let you go there at all. It won't even let you toy with that part. Is there anything that could be said to a person or counseled to a person to get them to realize that they're not harming people? And as just like you said, they're going to be harming people if they do leave. All I can speak to is my own experience. There is not one thing anyone could have said to me that would have changed that moment. Mm. It was decided. Now. I can take it a step further and say, I now realize that was part of my soul plan, which it was. But I also feel that whatever is going to happen in this expression is predetermined. And we are the witness to it. We're not the ones doing it. If you had a friend that was grieving over the loss of a loved one, what kind of advice would you give? I do right now. My best friend is going through this and her daughter and her daughters. I say to them the same thing I say to anyone, which is I'm not experientially living what you're feeling, but I will hold space for you in the most loving way I can. I never ever try to make what they're going through seem anything less than it needs to be in their own story. Nor do I try to step in and create a direct path to their loved one unless I'm asked to do so. You know, because I don't think that that's necessarily for everyone. So I just hold them in the most loving space and I go into my heart and I just send them as much love as I can to try to help buffer some of that suffering that they seem to be going through in their own matrix in any way that I can. I will communicate with their loved one on the other side from my own dimensionality, 
and my own higher self perspective. And I will say, gosh, they could sure love use some of your love right now. Not that they're separate from that. They're already aware of it, but it just seems to help me a little bit in those experiences. Kelly, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Yeah. So I get hundreds of emails a day. I just have one quick question and it's really hard. I do one-on-one -on -one work with people and I try my best to answer questions on my YouTube channel. I'm sure you get this all the time too. It's like, how do you keep up with it? It's a full-time job. That being said, whenever I do an interview like this, if people ask questions on the, the interview, I do my best to come through and try and answer them real time, or at least as close to real time as I can. But if they want a specific connection to do a full-blown session, it's better for them to do that in their own space. Obviously, you don't want that posted on YouTube. But I definitely do try to, you know, for me, this is about sharing, but I also live a life and I have to manage a little bit of it. But absolutely, after this interview comes out, I will scan the comments and questions and I will do my best to give an honest feedback. And if there's something big that seems to come through in rep repetition, I'll post it on my community tab and try and address it in a bigger overarching response so that they know. What's the name of your YouTube channel? Nurture Your Soul is what was birthed after this whole thing happened. And that was just, again, a spontaneous arising that happened. A friend didn't even tell me they were inviting a bunch of people over to meet this woman who had just had this near-death experience. And some lady in the room said, I feel like you just nurtured my soul. And bam, that's where it started. So nurture your soul. Do you have a website as well? Nurtureyoursoul.net. Well, before we finish up, can you give us one more positive message? Yeah, I'd like to emphasize that if you, we all have someone who's struggling with something, whether they call it depression or anxiety or just feeling super overwhelmed by life, they probably don't need your advice. They probably don't need you to tell them you're being selfish. They probably don't need you to tell them to get a stiff upper lip and buck on little chip. They probably need you to reach here and offer your love and breathe and not resist and be the aspect of the oneness that we all are and say, I can sit here with you through that because you deserve that. We all do. I don't like to hear people say suicide is selfish. Most people, not all, but most people, when they get to that place, truly believe the world would be better without them. It is in their mind, diseased mind, that it's a loving act, not a selfish act. So I guess just if you're asking for kindness in the world, start with you. Kelly, thank you for your message. And thank you for being my guest. Thanks for having me, Jeff. I mean, you, what you're doing, I love to say when anyone interviews me, you're an ambassador to the light. Um, this will hit right where it's supposed to. The right people will see it. The ones that feel triggered by it needed to hear something in it too. And I don't think that this is my work. This is our work. It's something bigger that's calling us all together. So thank you for having me and giving me this platform to just say, I send so much love to each and every one of you out there, especially those of you who are struggling or going through something. We all are just try as you might with, even if it's the faith, the size of a mustard seed to go into your heart and say, I know there's a loving something that's bigger than this moment and go with that. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.